Hello, this is Dan Beard, and I'm going to be telling you about a recent paper that we published called A Computational Analysis of the Long-Term Regulation of Arterial Pressure. Now, we're interested in understanding how arterial pressure is regulated in health and in disease. Uh, one of the reasons is because hypertension, that's when blood pressure gets too high, is one of the leading risk factors for uh, mortality. According to the World Health Organization, high blood pressure, hypertension is the number one leading risk factor. Uh, if you look in a good medical physiology textbook, it will tell you that we really don't know what causes hypertension. Just like we really don't have a complete solid understanding of how blood pressure is controlled physiologically. If you look in a not so good physiology textbook, they'll tell you we've got it all figured out. They'll tell you, for example, uh, well, they'll tell you specifically that the long term mechanisms or the mechanisms involved in a long term control of arterial blood pressure are something called pressure natu naturesis and pressure diuresis. And so pressure, that, that stands for the relationship between arterial pressure and the rate of uh, urine and sodium excretion. And based on this, this concept of blood pressure control, uh, these textbooks will conclude that the ultimate, you know, central player in um, the pathogenesis of hypertension is uh, pressure diuresis, pressure naturesis, that is, it, it, in the kidneys. And so these concepts were, were really championed by uh, someone named Arthur Guyton, and Arthur Guyton was, a, was the um, author of, of this particular textbook here. And you know, e even though this was not exactly Guyton's idea, what Guyton did was, was promote this idea more than anybody else, and, and to the point where uh, people that subs subscribe to this viewpoint are actually called Guytonians. And the viewpoint itself is, is called the Guytonian viewpoint. It's, you could also call it the renogenic viewpoint or the pressure diuresis uh, theory of blood pressure regulation or of the pathogenesis of, of hypertension. So what we set out to do, well, okay, so let, let me explain to you what that, what that theory is first. It's, it, it's really pretty straightforward and it's a compelling idea. And so the basic idea is that the, that the higher the blood volume, that's what V stands for here, the higher the arterial pressure. And that happens be, by, um, you know, uh, primarily by um, elastic kind of relationships of the blood vessels. So you can imagine as you put more blood into an elastic vessel, the pressure goes up. As you, as you fill the veins more, then the pressure to fill the heart during uh, diastole increases, and therefore the heart fills more, the heart pumps more, the heart produces more cardiac output, uh, more pressure. So the higher the blood volume, the higher the pressure. At the same time, what the kidney does is the higher, is it changes the blood volume by creating urine. And the higher the pressure through this mechanism called pressure diuresis, um, arterial pressure goes up, glomerular filtration rate goes up, rate of urine production goes up. And so the rate of volume change becomes negative as pressure is higher than some, some set point in the control system. And when the pressure is lower than that set point, then the rate of volume uh, it, change is positive and volume increases. And so this is a really simple control mechanism by which um, blood pressure is controlled. And the idea is that regardless of all the other things that are happening with autonomic reflexes, endocrine system, et cetera, it has to, there's a set point uh, set by the kidney and um, the, it, for the blood pressure to change, that kidney set point has to change and therefore the kidney is, the, is at the root of um, uh, long-term changes in blood pressure. So we set out to build a computational model to kind of explore those concepts a little bit deeper. And, and you know, a central component of that computational model is uh, a kidney uh, with, a, with a pressure diuresis relationship acting as a something of a physiological input-output. That means uh, depending on the pressure, then that um, rate of urine, rate of volume change is determined based on, on, on that. However, that pressure diuresis relationship is influenced by the renin angiotensin system and it's influenced by the bowel reflex and therefore the, the nervous system and the endocrine system of course interact with the, the kidney and with the heart and the circulation and the question is how in, in, in such a system even a, based on a relatively simple circuit model in such a system how, how is blood pressure controlled and what are the possible mechanisms of uh, increased blood pressure or hypertension. So the, si the simple model is based on uh, this lumped parameter circuit where you have a 
uh, uh, left ventricle. So the model is only accounting for the systemic circulation. We have a left ventricle, which is simulated as a varying elastance, or in, in, in an electrical analog, it's a capacitor with a varying capacitance. And so when the capacitance is high, the elasticity is low, uh, and that's diastole. In systole, the elastance goes up, the capacitance goes down, and, um, and, and the, the blood is ejected from the heart. You have pressure development and ejection. There's valves which keep the blood flowing in one direction. And, um, and we have resistors and capacitors representing different lumped uh, compartments of the circulation. And these variables, phi, represent um, the, the sympathetic nervous tone and the uh, rate and angiotensin system, which have influences on the resistances and the compliances in the circuit. So this is, this is the backbone of the model. Uh, on top of this backbone, we have models of uh, the kidney. We have a model of the renin angiotensin system. We have a model of the baroreflex. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail, just one of those um, components, and that is the baroreflex, just to give you an idea of how we built this model. So the way the baroreflex works on, on um, uh, the baroreceptors, which sit in large arteries in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinus, when you stretch the vessel, when you increase the pressure, you get an increase in, in firing rate, which um, uh, an afferent firing rate, which is a nervous signal which goes back to the central nervous system. And what happens as you increase pressure, you get this important phenomenon, physiological phenomenon of graded response. So the higher the increase in pressure, the, the, the faster you, um, uh, firing of the, of, the, of the afferent vessels you have this adaptation phenomenon which is very important and that is uh, in these experiments uh, published in 1984 by, by, by Coleridge, um, what ha uh, this was a sort of the um, response to a pressure ramp measured under um, normal conditions. The same, an, an, same animal was, um, had his pressure raised by 25 millimeters of mercury to a, to a mean level of 125 millimeters of mercury for 20 minutes and then uh, um, another uh, barrel reflex response curve was measured, and you can see that the um, barrel receptors shift. The, the response curve, sh the response curve shifted to the right, and the barrel receptors are said to have adapted. By the way, I should mention that um, in this paper, all we did is is, is a computational model based on uh, data which were. Pr from the from the previous literature, so there are no new uh, experimental measurements published in in, in this paper, uh, the paper that we published. And it, so, for example, we used data from this 1984 journal physiology paper by Cluridge et al. Okay, so the other thing that's important to capture in modeling the barrier reflex, which is actually part of this adaptation response, is a slow versus a fast time scan. What's meant by that is these these are experiments from um, in, in isolated vessels where the uh, vessel is, is distended with a step increase in pressure, and what you see is you see a spike in firing rate of baroreflex afferent vessel, afferent fibers, um, followed by a very rapid um, uh, decrease of that spike, and then a, a slow, much slower decay uh, over um, timescales of, of um, many seconds to minutes. So this is something that's captured by the equations that we developed to simulate the barrel receptor afferent firing rate, and you can read about the details in, in the paper. Uh, the, the parameters for these, um, f for these, this, this mathematical model are identified based on data which we obtained from the literature. The next thing we can do with a model like that is then simulate uh, those those pressure ramp and uh, experiments that we we saw earlier from from Coolridge. So what we do is we we gradually ramp up from a resting initial state the pressure, or we can gradually ramp down. And what happens is when you do that experiment, the baroreceptors fire um, have have a peak in, in firing rate when there's a peak in pressure, okay, and then they decrease when, they, when, when you go into diastole. When you look at the mean firing rate over a, um, over a heartbeat, you get this red curve, which you compare to the data points, which are these open circles. Do the same experiment after holding the, the model at a higher um, baseline pressure for 20 minutes, and the, and the response shifts to the right. So we're capturing these important phenomena of the baroreceptor, the graded response, the, the re resetting or the adaptation, and these um, fast versus these slow timescales. So that's the baroreceptor. 
we put all these things together, um, including other components which you can read about in the manuscript, and we have a model to simulate uh, blood pressure control over, over the long term. We can simulate this for, for many minutes up to hours, and here's an example of simulating an experiment where um, blood was injected into an animal and the, the blood volume in the animal has actually increased a tremendous amount, about, about a 50% increase in blood volume. And what happens when, when you do that is you get a relatively small increase in pressure of about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury and that small increase in pressure, the uh, reason that pressure increase is not so much bigger is because of the control system. So the, re the, the, the these solid curves are model predictions, by the way, and the model predicts that the sympathetic nervous tone goes way down the uh, renin and, and then ultimately angiotensin uh, activity in the, in the plasma goes down and that uh, through, through that neural humoral response not plotted here, the heart rate goes down and the, um, uh, the va vascular tone goes down and that keeps the pressure from going up too much and then over the longer time scale because of the increase in the rate of urine formation the blood volume eventually returns to normal. We can do a simulation of the opposite kind of experiment, that is a hemorrhage or, or, a, or a blood withdrawal experiment, and, in, in, and that what happens in that case is, is the opposite. Sympathetic nervous tone goes up, heart rate goes up, and the pressure is, is maintained to a certain extent uh, by these increases in these, in these reflex responses, which allow the pr uh, pressure to be maintained. Another kind of experiment, um, it, here's that name, Guyton again, by the way. Another kind of experiment that we simulate in the paper is an experiment where uh, the uh, pressure is changed and the rate of uh, urine sodium excretion or urine rate or the rate of urine production is measured in order to assay this, this chronic pressure diuresis relationships this is, or, or um, Actually, more accurately, th th these relationships between mean arterial pressure and urine sodium excretion uh, over measured chronically are called the chronic renal function curve. And these things are, uh, I I in, this, in this case, experiments were done with an angiotensin uh, uh, converting enzyme inhibitor, which makes angiotensin levels uh, very small very low and pressure is, is low, it's a normal curve, and then with angiotensin infusion, uh, pressure is very high, and we can, we can uh, mimic this experiment or we can simulate this experiment using our model by, in, by infusing angiotensin computationally or by inhibiting the production of angiotensin computationally, and we can match these data. In the end, what we can do is, what we, what we, what we do is we, we, we probe some of these uh, ideas in the literature, this prevailing wisdom that the bar, for example, that the bar reflex cannot participate in the long-term control of arterial pressure. So that uh, prevailing wisdom uh, is a result of the observation that the bar reflex resets to a higher pressure. Therefore, if the bar reflex resets to a higher pressure, when pressure is increased, it's not telling you a signal to return the pressure to baseline. Uh, it's not really that simple. It turns out that that's a, a, a gross oversimplification. Uh, that interpretation, and it turns out that overstimulation of the bare reflex results in a chronic pressure drop. Understimulation results in a long-term pressure increase. This is true in the ex in, in actual physiological experiments, and it's true in our model. Uh, the concept that arterial blood pressure is under all circumstances controlled primarily by the kidney, also a gross oversimplification. Uh, it turns out to be simply wrong. Arterial pressure is governed primarily by the coordinate a coordinated actions of neural endocrine systems. Kidney's part of that process, but it, it holds no privileged status. The concept that the ultimate reason for hypertension is necessarily uh, a uh, renal centric or renogenic is um, just an idea that's really not supported by either any kind of theory or, or sound experimental observations, and it's more of an article of faith than uh, a scientific theory. That's it. Enjoy the paper, and uh, thank you very much.